series publications of the Smithsonian Institution, Smithsonian Studies in Air and Space No. 2, United States Women in Aviation Through World War I, by Claudia M. Oakes. Aerial Photography from Fortations. Visit Fortations.com and www.fortationsstore.com for more fine art photography. Help support this series by visiting Fortationsdonations.com. Harriet Quimby. Although there may be some question about America's first aviatrix, there is no question whatsoever about the first to receive her pilot's license. She was Harriet Quimby, the darling of her day. In her plum satin flying costume, she captured the admiration of all who saw her fly or read of her exploits. There is some mystery regarding Quimby's origins, however. She let it generally be believed that she had been born into a wealthy family on an orange plantation in Royo Grand, California in 1884 and educated in private schools in America and Europe. However, there is evidence that shows she was born in 1875 in Coldwater, Michigan, the daughter of a farmer. She was educated in public schools there thanks to the sacrifice of her hardworking mother. Her family did move to California and there, in 1902, Harriet took a job as a writer for the Dramatic Review in San Francisco, also doing some features for The Call and The Chronicle. In 1903, she began writing for Leslie's Weekly, a popular magazine of the time, and moved to New York as the publication's drama critic, a New York her circle of friends included many of the day's most interesting people, among them those of the small but well-known aviation community such as the Moisant brothers, Jan and Albert, and their sister Madeld Harriet's interest in aviation was transformed into enthusiasm when she attended the 1910 Belmont Park Aviation Meet, 2231 October. She was so inspired, especially by John Moisson's performance, that when she happened to see him that evening having dinner at the Hotel Astor, she asked him to teach her to fly. He agreed, perhaps really not taking her seriously. But Harry refused to abandon the idea, even after John Moisson was killed while performing in New Orleans on 31 December 1910. The Moissant School of Aviation was opened at Hempstead, Long Island, in April 1911, and Harriet began taking lessons there from Andrew Halpert and a Blair-type 30 monoplane. After four months and 33 lessons, Harriet decided to try for her license. Her review board consisted of two judges from the Aero Club of America, which under the authority of the Federation Aeronautic International was the licensing agency for the United States to obtain a license. She had to land her aircraft within 100 feet of where she left the ground. On 31 July 1911, on her first test, she landed too far from the spot, but the next day she landed 7 feet 9 inches from the mark. Thus, on 1 August 1911, Harriet Quimby became the first licensed woman aviator in the United States, receiving duration of the Internationally Aero Club of America Certificate Number 37. She was the second woman in the world to receive a license, the Baroness Raymond de la Roche of France having received hers in 1910. Almost immediately, Harriet was asked to join the Moisson International Aviators, an exhibition team, and on 2 September 1911, she participated in a meet before 20,000 spectators on Staten Island. Later that month, she entered a meet at the Nassau Boulevard Airfield, 
during which she beat the celebrated French aviatrix on the trio in a cross country race, winning dollar in the amount of six hundred. The next month, she went with the Moisan Group to Mexico City to perform in the inauguration ceremonies for President Francisco Madero, while their Harriet became the first woman to fly over Mexico City. She still contributed to Leslie's Weekly and wrote an account of her Mexico trip for that magazine. She also sent a very complete report of her next and perhaps most famous exploit, the first flight across the English Channel by woman pilot Leslie's Weekly and the London Daily Mirror were her sponsors. Her manager and advisor was Elia Stevens, friend of the Wright brothers and famous balloon pilot. She sails for Europe on 7 March 1912. In France, she acquired a new Blariot 50 monoplane, which she had shipped to Dover Harriet, was not to be the first woman to cross the English Channel by air. However, for on 2 April 1912, an English woman, Miss Eleanor Trahuk Davies, crossed but only as a passenger with the British flyer Gustav Hamel. Harry continued, undaunted either by Miss Davies' flight or by the weather, the latter was so bad that she could not even test fly her new aircraft. Sunday, 14 April, was a lovely day, perfect for a channel flight. But Harriet had made a personal rule never to fly on a Sunday. The weather closed in again on Monday, but on Tuesday, 16 April 1912, at 5.30 a.m., Harriet took off from the heights of Dover. Gustav Hamel, who had been advising her, had been able to make a short flight in the aircraft prior to takeoff to make sure it ran smoothly. From the beginning, Hamel had been skeptical about a woman's ability to pilot an aircraft across the channel. He even went so far as to suggest that he himself dress up in Harry's satin flying costume, pilot her plane across the channel, and land at a deserted spot where Harriet would be waiting to take the credit. Harriet, of course, refused his offer, so Hamill helped her as much as he could, even instructing her on the use of a compass in flight, a technique which was new for Harriet. He also tied a hot water bottle around her waist as protection from the wind's chill. Almost immediately after takeoff, Harriet found herself in thick clouds. She dropped from an altitude of 2,000 feet to about 1,000 feet, and though dazzled by the rising sun, could see the shores of France being unfamiliar with the French coast. Harriet could not find her goal clay. She descended onto a flat, sandy fishing beach and was immediately surrounded by villagers who had heard of her flight. She was at Harlot, 25 miles south of Calais. She was fated in Paris and London and returned in triumph to the United States in May. She brought with her a new all-white Blariot 70 to see monoplane with all the latest improvements during that summer she performed at various aviation meets, occasionally carrying passengers. In late June, she shipped her aircraft to Boston, where from 29 June to 7 July, she planned to take part in the hard Boston aviation meet held at Squantum Airfield near Dorchester. The manager of the event was William A. P. Willard, father of Charles F. Willard, the noted Curtis exhibition pilot. Many famous aviators were participating, among them Glenn L. Martin, Lincoln Beachy, Earl Ovington, and Blanche Scott. Late in the day on 1 July, Harriet and William Willard climbed into her blurry for a short flight over Dorchester Bay and around Boston Light. Willard was a large man 
and her manager, Leo Stevens, cautioned him to remain very still out of fear that almost any movement on his part could upset the balance of the aircraft. The flight went well at first. Harriet rounded Boston Light and came back over the field at about 3,000 feet, then circled while slowly descending to 1,000 feet over the bay. Suddenly the plane dived sharply, and Willard was thrown from his seat. Without his weight, the Blariot momentarily righted itself, but then flipped over, tossing Harriet out. Also, the two landed in about five feet of water, and both were killed. Ironically, the plane came out of its dive and glided to a landing with relatively little damage. Blanche Scott was in the air at the time, competing for the women's duration prize. She abandoned her attempt after the accident and landed her aircraft. There was a great deal of speculation by leading aviation authorities as to the cause of the tragedy. Leo Stevens blamed Willard thinking he probably ignored the advice given him and leaned forward to congratulate Harriet on a successful flight. Earl Ovington thought that one of the two left and control wires had become entangled in the warping lever. Lincoln Beachy speculated that Harriet might have fainted or that he had attempted to descend at too steep an angle. Glenn Martin pointed out that had Harriet and Willard been using seat belts, the accident might not have occurred. Whatever the reason for the crash, Americans mourned their beloved Harriet Quinby.